Israel cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye my hand, O house of Israel. Then go to Romans chapter 9, and for those of you with your Bible, I'll give you a chance to turn there. Romans chapter 9, and then we're going to read verse number 21. Romans chapter 9, verse 21. The scripture reads, Hath not the pot potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? And then going to Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin with verse number 14. Ephesians 5 and beginning with verse number 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning, dear God, asking that as your word comes forth, you open our hearts to receive, our ears to hear, and our minds to understand, dear God, and help us, Lord Jesus, to engulf in your word and to walk out of here a different person. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I know whenever I hear someone, or a minister, thank you, Sister Watson, whenever I hear a minister begin to read scripture from Jeremiah chapter 18, the first thing I think about is we're going to hear about the potter's house. How many of you thought that? How many thought I would go and preach about the potter's house? Come on, be honest, raise your hand. Okay, I'm not. I'm not preaching about the potter's house. Probably one reason because just what I said, that's the first thing we think about. But, there is something I want to preach to you about off of that scripture. And it's going to sound a little different because it's not really the potter's house. But I want to preach to you about this thought on the amble. On the amble. How many of you here have ever read Max Lucado's books? You know who he is? He's a Christian author, fairly decent Christian author. He's written quite a few books. One of the books that he wrote is entitled On the Amble which is where I took my title from. And uh, in the introduction of the book, he tells the story of the blacksmith shop. And it goes like this. In the shop of the blacksmith, there are three types of tools. There are tools on the junk pile, outdated, broken down, dull, rusty, they sit in the cobweb corner, useless to their master, oblivious to their calling. There are tools on the anvil, melted down, molten hot, moldable, changeable. They lie on the anvil, being shaped by their master, accepting their calling. There are tools of usefulness, sharpened, primed, defined, mobile. They lie in the blacksmith's tool chest, available to their master, fulfilling their calling. Some people lie useless, lives broken, talents wasting, fires quenched, dreams dashed. They are tossed in with a scrap iron in desperate need of repair with no notion of purpose. Others lie on the anvil, hearts open, wounds healing. Visions clearing. They welcome the painful pounding of the blacksmith's hammer, longing to be rebuilt, begging to be called. Others lie in the master's hand, well-tuned, uncompromising, polished, productive. They respond to their master's forearm, demanding nothing, surrendering all. He finishes up that part of the book this way. We are all somewhere in the blacksmith shop. We are either on the scrap metal, 
in the master's hand on the anvil or in the tool chest. And some of us have been in all three. So I wonder this morning, which part of the blacksmith shop you were on. But the part that I want to bring to you is the part where you may feel like you're on the anvil. Maybe you're not there today. Maybe you were there in the past and couldn't understand why. But I guarantee you this, that it will come in the future. God will put you on the anvil. Now there's something I want to mention to you before we talk about being on the anvil. And that is this, that we as the church must understand that the church will never die from immorality in Hollywood. Or the corruption that is going on in the world today. But the church will die from within. It will die from what can be known as corrosion. From those who bear the name of Jesus, but really do not know Him. It will die from those who have religion, but no relationship. Think of Judas. He bore a cloak of religion, but never knew the heart of Jesus. So I say to you, the church today, let's make it our goal to know Him deeply. Mark said these words, or Jesus said these words in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 18. Having eyes, see ye not. And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? If nothing else this morning from this sermon, I hope that you will open your spiritual eyes and you will open your spiritual ears and you open your spiritual heart and receive what God wants this church to receive this morning. So I'm here to tell you and to mention to you today, don't let corrosion or corrosion come into your life. Because it is sly and wily. That's what corrosion is, it's sly and wily. You see, corrosion lurks, lurks in every dark corner. And it lurks in every musty hole. And the thing about corrosion, he don't care if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're young, if you're old, he strikes everybody the same way. Because to corrosion, they are all his prey. Every one of you sitting here this morning is the prey of corrosion. But I want you to understand that you do not need to let corrosion slip in to your life today. He silently creeps his way into every life. And when he begins to do it, he seldom misses his mark. He creeps up, and many times we are unaware he is near until he strikes. All we see is the results of his deadly bite. And the results look something like this. The blank face. The non-reflective hearts. The presence of God is in a place and some are just sitting there. It's a non-reflective heart. The questionless minds and the empty lives. That's what corrosion looks like. But understand this today, he does not come alone. He brings a friend. And it is that friend that I want to mention to you a little more about today. That friend is not greed, although we may think that it would be. Nor is it lust, although that would fit right in. And it's not egotism, although that would be fit right in too. Even those three things are deadly. To our walk with the Lord. 
The one I want to talk to you about today is described in the dictionary as this. Self-satisfaction accompanied by unawareness of actual danger or deficiencies. It goes on and it can further be described as life with no questions, blind acceptance, no probing, no searching, and no yearning. So that's not greed. That's not egotism. That's not lust. That's not any of those things. So what is it that I'm talking to you about? It's complacency. Too many times, even we as apostolics let complacency set into our life. We let complacency come in. And we may not even know that it's there, but it is. We can become complacent if you are asking yourself how or am I complacent? Let me give you something to think about. Are you ready for this? Here we go. You say you're ready, so we'll find out. One, two times a week, we pay our dues by walking into the church with our minds somewhere else. We endure the service, and then we walk out saying to ourselves, I've done my part for today. I've done my part Sunday morning. I was in there, and I, they seen my face, and I raised my hands like everyone else, even though I didn't mean anything by it. Or Wednesday night, we come in, I've done my part. The pastor see me, I was sitting right there on the front row. And so when you begin to feel that way, complacency is entering in. But when we begin to get complacent, guess what happens? Bam! God! put you on the anvil. Because on the anvil is where he reshapes and where he remolds. And if you've ever watched a blacksmith, they can't take that piece that they want to reshape and just start pounding on it. But they have to stick it in the heat. And they have to let it get a little hot. In fact, they let it get a little more than a little hot. And then they reach over and they grab that hammer and boom! Bang, whap, thump, and it begins to shape. See, the potter actually has it a little bit easier. He really does. Because he don't use hot metal. And it's not hot coming out of the oven with him. Because it hasn't went in the oven yet. He's taking the clay and he's spinning his wheel and he's shaping and he's molding. And it's great when God does that. He can do that way too. But there are those times when we have to be on the anvil. And it's those times on the anvil that we feel the pain. We feel the hurt. We feel the brokenness. But God is saying, I've got you on the anvil for a purpose. I'll talk a little bit more on that a little later. About being on the anvil. You see, Satan has a deadly trick. In fact, he has many deadly tricks. But he has a deadly trick that puts a child of God into complacency. And it's not to rob us of the answer, but it's to rob us of the questions. Why am I having these lonely nights? Is it because God is putting you on the anvil and saying it's time to play? Why did he send this guy clear over to my camping site? Of all places. I wanted to enjoy myself with my two girls and Jeray. Why did he do it? Is it possible he put you on the anvil? Because he says, Dan, it's time 
to be a better witness. It's time to let the courage rise up. That's why the lonely nights or why the broken hearts. I don't understand why my heart is breaking. I don't understand what's taking place. It's because God is putting us on the anvil. And then there may be the question, why the broken marriages? Could it be that it only looks like the marriage is going to be broken? But God's putting you on the anvil. And he's beginning to make you and shape you and mold you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 says this. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. So now for a little while. If need be, ye have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perisheth. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's got you on the end. Like I said, you may have been there before and didn't understand, but now maybe you can understand a little bit why everything happened. You may be there right now, and I'm t- helping you understand why it's happening. And if you haven't been there, if you're not there right now or haven't been in the past, like I said, I guarantee you in the future, the anvil is going to come. Because I've been there. I know. Maybe... You're feeling melted down, undone, feeling useless. But God has placed you on the anvil for reshaping because you have too many rough edges. Your rough edge may be that you like to pray, but the prayer only happens one time a week. That's pretty rough. No wonder God's putting you on the anvil. No wonder he's causing the lonely nights, brother. Wally, no wonder he's causing the broken heart. No wonder he's causing those things that you don't understand. Because a prayer life isn't what it should be. And so God may put you on in a situation. He's putting you on an anvil where all you know to do is to pray. Your motivation has waned. Oh, you mean it's Sunday and I got to go to church again? It's Wednesday. Who's teaching so I can decide if I want to stay home? Is it Pastor Dan that's teaching? Or is it Sister Leanna that's teaching? I want to stay home if it's not Pastor Boyd. Motivation is waning. Your motivation should not be to come to church on who's preaching or teaching. But your motivation needs to be I'm coming to the house of God because I can feel the presence of God because I'll be able to raise my hand. I'll be able to praise Him. I'll be able to worship Him. So don't let your motivation wane. Because when it does, complacency is in free will. Maybe your desire is distant. Maybe your passion has slipped out the door. And your enthusiasm has flown out the window. Where's your passion for the Word of God? The passion for the Word of God doesn't mean that I'm just going to read it one time a week. It doesn't mean I'm just going to read it on Saturday morning. Or I'll feel really good and I'll wait till Sunday morning to read it. That way when I'm done reading the Word of God, I can go in church and I'm all excited because I read the Word of God this week. I did not picture this sermon going this way, by the way. But your motivation and your desire and your passion 
needs to be, I want to read the Word of God because in the Word of God I will find eternal life. In the Word of God, I will find the answer to my problem. In the Word of God, I will find the answer for my healing. In the Word of God, I will find out what God has for me in my life. If you need a little bit of help reading the Word of God, just buy a Bible reading program. And if you don't want to buy one, go on you version. Because that's free. And guess what? When you get behind, it tells you. If you haven't read it for a week, you pop it up and it says, yeah, just about. (laughs) So we need to let our passion come back in. And we should not let the the enthusiasm fly out the window. Some of us think we're enthusiastic when the presence of God comes in. And we just do a little bit of jig. But you know what? When that enthusiasm comes in, when you begin to hear the word of God, and when it begins, and you know you got to apply it to your life and to your heart, don't cry about it, but rejoice about it. Remember this, on the anvil we come face to face with the master because we realize we have no place to go. And don't think you're the only one that has been on the anvil because others have been. Have you ever thought that David was actually on the anvil? When you read about David... You read about how great a guy he is until one part of the Bible. And then you read about how he was on the rooftop. And he was looking out. And he seen this beautiful woman. And he committed sin. But you would think it stopped there, but it didn't, did it? It didn't stop with just one sin, but it went to another sin. And yet, even after all that took place, God said, he's a man after my own heart. Why did he say that? Because God put him on the anvil. And he sent a prophet. And the prophet told him a story. And David, being the king, could have said, get out of my face. Get out of my life. You guard, grab him, behead him. He could have done that. But maybe it was because David realized he was on the anvil that he came off of that kingly throne and he went down to his knees and he began to pray and he began to seek God and he wrote one of the greatest psalms in my book that he ever wrote. God created me a clean heart. Renew within me a right spirit. You see, when you're on the anvil, that will take place. And so David had been on the anvil. And there's another one. Oh, my. Okay, I was told not to worry about my time, so. How about Peter? He was on the anvil. He said, egotism came in. I'm never going to deny you, God. No way, Lord. I followed you for three and a half years, or three years, depending on your theology. But I'm never going to deny you. But guess what happened? Before the rooster crowed three times that night, he denied him three times, just like the Lord said he would. And bam! On the anvil he goes. Because he realized what he had just done. And with tear-stained faces, we don't read the prayer that Peter prayed. But perhaps, Brother Wally, it was, God, forgive me. Please forgive what I have done. 
I didn't know what I was doing. And so God put him on the anvil. For the Lord already told him Satan desires you, but I prayed for you, Peter. Or how about Paul? We can read many things about Paul. How he was whipped. How he was left for dead. But you know what I believe? I believe Paul took those as being on the anvil. But maybe it all began before he prayed through. Before he had the Holy Ghost. When he was on the road to Damascus. And God blinded him. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? What am I doing here? I've got you on the anvil, Paul. You need to feel what's going on, Paul. I'm using my hammer, Paul, and I'm going to thump you a little bit. And I'm going to bang on you a little bit. Because... Paul, I have a work for you. So I want you to understand today that anvil time is not to be avoided. It's to be experienced. I said anvil time is not to be avoided when you begin to feel that little heat coming on or that little bit of thumping. And banging. You don't get up and run. You say, God, let me experience this anvil again. I don't know how many times you'll have to go through it in your life, but it's going to happen more than once. Like I said, Paul had his anvil at the road of Damascus. Then he got whipped. Then he got put in jail. God was saying, Paul, I got you down here in the dungeon. What are you going to do now? He didn't sing victory in Jesus because that song wasn't written then, although he might have had his own way. But you see, God shaped him and molded him. Whenever you are on the anvil, don't ask why. Don't wonder what is happening. But be thankful. The question you may ask yourself is why? Am I on this anvil? So I'm going to give you your answer right now so when it happens you'll understand what it is. God knows you're worth reshaping. I said God knows you're worth reshaping. That's why when the anvil time comes, sister, that's why when the anvil time, you begin to feel all that. God is reshaping you and he's remolding you and he's saying i got a greater work for you. That's why you want to experience the anvil time, not run from it. Let's go back to complacency for a minute. I promise I won't hold you more than another hour. It won't be that long. Understand this today, in case you haven't picked it up already. Coming out of complacency may cause thumping. You see, when a potter bakes a pot, he checks it by pulling it out of the oven and thumping it. I'm not sure if he uses his finger or if he uses a hammer because I've never watched it. But anyway, that's what happens. And if it does what they call sing... Then it goes on the shelf because it's ready to be sold. But if it thuds, it goes back into the oven. So I have a question for you. Have you been thumped lately? 
Those of you that are in school, have you had grouse, grouchy teachers lately? Could be a thumping because God's reshaping you. He already knows what your attitude is, so he's trying to change it. How about a grouchy boss? I've had enough of those when I was working. God's thumping you. Here's a good one for you. How about a flat tire? You wait until quarter to ten to make it to church by ten o'clock. No, that's the wrong time. You wait until quarter to eleven to make it to church by eleven o'clock. And you go out and you look. Oh, I got a flat tire. How are you going to react? Oh, you stupid car. What'd you go flat for, tire? Because the tire didn't run over the nail. You did. Maybe God's thumping you. Find out what your attitude's like. But well, here's another good one. Driving down I-5, doing that speed limit just like you're supposed to be doing, and all of a sudden you see a bunch of red lights. And there's a traffic jam in front of you. Now, some will get tied up in a traffic jam. You know that if they were living for God, they would probably be thumping, getting a thumping. Because beep, beep, beep. Ain't nothing you can do. Maybe that traffic jam is your thumping. All right, here's a good one. You go into your favorite store, Walmart. <laughs> I'm only picking. I'm only picking on this because Sister Leander's Leander's sitting there. You go into your favorite store, Walmart, and they got. 20 cash registers. And two, at the most, three cashiers. And the line is halfway down, or better than that, you go in dollar store. And the line is all the way back at the end of the store. My wife's been thumped a few times <laughs> in the dollar store, not Walmart. Well, she's mentioned Walmart too, but mainly in dollar store because of those long lines. You're being thumped. You know what that thumping's for because God wants to check your attitude. And all of these that I mentioned could be a thumping process because God is seeing if you will sing or thud. Are you going to sing? You got this big old tall guy that's three heads taller than you behind you in Walmart line. And he's sitting there just, go ahead. And you got 40 more people in front of you. And you're just waiting and you keep hearing this. There you go. Get to take one step. Ten minutes later, you get to take another step. See, God's checking you. See if you're going to sing or if you're going to flood. And you take one more step. And you get thumped again. So are you going to sing and say, man, I'm sure glad to see you today. You know, I go to Abundant Life Apostolic Church and I'd like you to go with me on Sunday. Well, when you get thumped in that line, are you going to turn around and say, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> you know, you never know who's behind you. You just feel that. Meh, meh. So you turn around, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> I 
So you're going to be thumped? You're going to sing or you're going to be a thud? Not a dud, a thud. There's nothing like a good thumping to reveal our real nature. When you feel like you were being thumped, thank God for the thumping. Not a half-hearted thank you, but a rejoicing, jumping for joy. Thank you. Remember that when God is thumping us, He is doing it for our own good. Remember that every thump is to remind us that God is molding us. Catch what Paul wrote in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, verse 7. I've got all these scriptures memorized because I can read it back there. <laughs> if, you, if you endure chastising, chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? You know, when my son was young, if he did something wrong, he, he found out about it. But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are all illegitimate and not sons. Next verse. Or is that eight? Let's go to nine. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subje subjection to the Father of spirits and life? Think about that. You have fathers, earthly fathers, that will correct you, help you, reshape you, and you give them respect. But when God comes and He begins to reshape us and remold us and correct us, we want to throw in the towel and give it all up. Verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chast chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. What I'm telling you, church, is this. Let and learn from each thump. Go ahead, get on the other. Don't worry about it. Face up to the fact that you are not thumped. You are not ample proof you will be tested so learn from the thumping learn from the ample I could have said a whole lot more on this sermon a whole lot more. But if I did, I'd be getting into pastoral territory, and I don't want to do that. So, in closing, let me sum this up. The musicians will come. Ample time can be caused by death. Epic can be caused by a breakup. It can be caused by growing, going broke. And will definitely be caused by going prayerless. You see what happens sometimes when you're on the anvil is the light switch is flipped off and the room is in darkness. Remember that when it is ample time, we are brought face to face with God. 
out of the utter realization that we have nowhere else to go. Ample time means we could be like Jesus in the garden praying that this cup pass from me. You see, even though Jesus was God manifested in the flesh, he still had his ample time. Because he went to the garden. And he knelt down. And he prayed. Came back and his disciples were asleep. He says, Can't you just wait for another hour? Went to pray again. Only this time it was ample time. Because this time he prayed from the very depth of his soul, from the very depth of his heart. And he said, Lord, yeah. Let this cup pass from me. But if not, let your will be done. You see, on the ample time, it may be, Sister Leanna, that we're praying, God, I don't want this to take place. I don't want this to happen. But God's shaping and molding you. And so you need to say, not my will, 